just to remind you that real gases, so uh, I should have probably written this first, real gases have real gas equations versus the ideal or perfect gas, which is PV equals MRT, which is high school level. We talked about how you can just, you, you hopefully knew that that wasn't PV equals MRT cannot work for all gases, although it says it does. You should know that, mm, would it work at a million degrees? Would it work at the interior of the sun? You should think about that and say, no, I, I expect something that's not work right there, nor should it, you're right. And so this gets, this is much better. This is the, we talked first about the Muriel equation. I may use that for problem sets. I don't use it in class, just to let you know that it exists. I'm gonna use the Van der Waals equation. That's this guy. Remember, this is the BM form. BM form means that volume per mole because it really is easier to do calculus and, and other things with it. Um, and where I was kind of in a rush, I was babbling about how the B parameter, I was getting B and A mixed up, that's where I really felt bad. Um, the B parameter we did through some general algebraic manipulation, which a middle school student could do, because that's when you learn algebra, uh, that this guy is related to the size of the molecule, and certainly this data seems consistent with that. And remember, this is some curve fitting engineer's data to this equation. Uh, you get A parameter from the same curve fitting, and they follow a trend in terms of melting temperature. And that says to me that A, as we also talked about, it's a little harder to see, A is related to uh, the fact that molecules interact. So, um, so let's see, B, B is volume. Remember, you even have has units of volume. A is, I'm using terrible grammar, uh, a, a is interaction. Uh, so all of this makes a lot of sense, right? If, if things don't interact, they would melt at a lower temperature. Uh, there we go. And A and B are also positive. I will use that in problem sets. Uh, big, big thing here, folks, just for those of you who care about grades, which is all of you, those algebraic manipulations, what, what I like to do on tests and homework, and especially on a test, and I like to do this on every test, those algebraic manipulations to figure out what A and B do, I, I will just change the equation and ask you to do that. And anyway, so now you know that. Okay, so that's where we got last time, and we're gonna just finish up discussing. Uh, so I'm just reviewing still, and I'm just <laughs> way too long. So, uh, more stuff on real gases. Uh, one thing that people also like to do is to evaluate the deviation of behavior of a real gas versus a perfect gas. That's what we're going to spend all day today on. And the way we do that, I should probably write that down. Uh, yeah, here's, here's how I'll put this. I'll say gas imperfections. Uh, and you see how it's to the speller I am. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's awful as spell check and grammar check on a lot of word programming things actually make about as many mistakes as they solve, which is a major problem for me. So anyway, uh, this is just to talk about my gas problem, which, yes, gets a snicker or two. <laughs> so one way that we, of all the ways we could evaluate how imperfect a gas is, um, one, one thing I would do is probably look at A and B parameters, and they, they ought to be close to zero. And you, you're doing that on a homework. Uh, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, but that's but A and B also kind of work together. You know, B obviously raises pressure. It looks like A lowers it. So sometimes the way they may balance out is not. You know, the fact that they're both maybe close to zero doesn't necessarily really mean what I think it means. So what I like to do is uh, define other ways to measure gas imperfections. And a big one that even in modern scientific literature I occasionally run into is called a compression factor. Uh, sorry, God, you gotta get older my spelling. My spelling gets worse. Actually, I'm hoping this will be the last time I actually film the video. I think I'm getting worse at this day and age. Uh, so compression factor, and uh, don't try to memorize it, it's the letter Z, and we do run out of letters, is uh, I've got two definitions, and I'm going to pick one here in a minute. This would be the real gas volume per mole divided by the perfect gas uh, volume per mole, which I would know this from the perfect gas equation, because gases aren't perfect gas. 
uh, experimental data versus fake data from PE equals NRT. Now that's all fine and good. I tend to, uh, let me double check myself, I tend to do it more in terms of pressure. These are, these are, would be the same thing. Uh, because, well, let, let me actually express this a different way. Uh, this, this does kind of get a little bit kind of spinny. Uh, let me see. Uh, I want to remind you that, um, again, the uh, perfect gas uh, volume per mole would be RT over P. Actually, I think that's the version I'm going to uh, P, P equals NRT. I can imagine that. Uh, now, now, what compression factor does um, and why it gets kind of funky about which one of these I choose to define it as is, uh, let me write down the perfect gas equation, RT. I'm going to write this in a little bit slightly different way. Here's the PV on the, on the right-hand side, I've written it on the left. Okay, perfect gas equation, which is not correct. So what Z does, um, this is correct, this is correct. This is just a different way of, of expressing what compression factor does. I like this way of expressing compression factor because it shows me it's it's... <laughs> Compression factor is a correction factor. This is not quite right. Just multiply it by a number that makes it right. And then normally I kind of hate that. Like, like the virial equation is just a Taylor series. I know Taylor series fits data. I don't need to be told that. I don't really get much out of the fact that that, that works. And I already know that. Uh, so compression factor at first kind of makes me go because, uh, <laughs> because I know that if the equation doesn't work, I can just multiply it by 0.5 or whatever and make it work. So that's a bit of a negative. Um, however, it actually does, uh, because I can actually manipulate the Van der Waals equation into this form, in other words, I can use the Van der Waals equation to determine Z, I actually, it kind of recovers its value, at least to me. And before I do that, let me show you what kind of values of Z you can expect. And again, I like to think of it this way as a correction factor to the, um, the perfect gas equation. Also, do not make a mistake. I once made on a problem set. Z is on this side, not that side. It actually, ma it actually matters quite a bit. You don't get to screw that up. Because as a correction factor, I was writing a problem set actually, and I didn't. I thought, oh, it doesn't matter if I multiply P, V, or R, T. Duh, it does. But let's not worry about that so much. Let me just show you what it looks like. And again, I'm going to be drawing data. Little, little sucky, but I wish I could do about it. Or actually, I could do something about it. I could just print some PowerPoint, but I choose not to. Nah. And so, <laughs> let me draw this as a function of pressure. And I'm going to choose atmospheres, mostly because this is the data I found. Oh, sorry, I'm, uh, it is atmospheres. I just need to write um, that number. Um, and uh, while I'm saying this, let me tell you a couple things about pressure. Uh, if you're dealing with uh, a, a container with two atmospheres of pressure, not, not that much, that's actually kind of dangerous. If you have glassware in an organic lab that's under two atmospheres of pressure, uh, crappy glass will explode at about that point and <laughs> yeah, it goes straight through your eyes. So these are dangerously, these are obscenely high pressure, these are dangerously high pressures, but Engineers do this to um, to make these measurements. And anyway, why did I dot z equals one? What does that correspond to? That should mean something. What, what, why would I do that? Uh, yeah, that's the ideal gas law, right? Exactly. So any deviation from that is um, is a real gas behavior. And let me first draw n two. Now n two is oddly a uh, very much it behaves like an ideal or perfect gas over a wide range of um, behaviors, uh, well, sorry, wide, wide range of uh, you know, pressures and temperatures. That's kind of awesome. And in fact, I think that's one of the reasons that crude analyses yielded PV equals NRT. Remember cowhead balloons? They got PV equals NRT right because the atmosphere is mostly nitrogen and nitrogen is mostly a perfect gas. That was actually kind of lucky in a lot of ways because if you start out studying the outliers, you're going to have a hard time figuring out generalities, right? Okay, so that's that's nice. 
Let me give you the oddballs. Uh, let me start with actually a normal oddball, uh, which is methane here. So this is CH4. And now let me give you a different type, type of all, oddball, which is H2. And again, sorry, the, hopefully you're not having too hard a time with that. H2. Okay, so um, there's that. Let me actually do another one. Uh, that is pressure. Let me do the effect of temperature. And notice I'm going to use a different scale um, because I have to. I can't really show you the nuances of what I'm trying to get across on the same scale. Um, no, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm going to do this. I'm going to still do uh, pressure. I'm going to go from 50 to 100. Again, that, that, that's really kind of scary big. And this is going to be for a single gas. I'm just going to do CO2. And anyway, uh, so sorry, drawing data. I have to. Sorry, I'm not, not interactive. I uh, don't want to screw this up too bad. Or I could just bring power points, but I don't feel like it. And so that's one temperature. And there's another temperature, 304. 1K, anyway, I got these out of a different book, matter. Um, it's accurate enough. So my point is, is that, okay, here's how the Z changes with pressure. I can see a trend, small molecule, little heart. So if I could, if I could shrink myself down and pick up uh, hydrogen, H2, or helium, it would feel like a really, really, um, I guess it'd be light, technically. It'd be like a billiard ball. And if I shrink myself down and pick up methane, I guess it would be kind of bumpy, but it would be kind of squishy. And sure enough, I think that has something to do with these Z factors, the pressure factors. I also get, and I'll write this down in a second, uh, for something like CO2, which is very squishy, if I, get, if I can shrink myself down and pick it up, this would be a foosball, three foosballs stuck together. Um, wait, is that right? What's a, uh, like a Nerf ball. Actually, I don't know what, what is a foosball? I just said that without knowing what it is. Um, oh, right, right, right. Oh, no, that's, uh, sorry, I don't know what's wrong with me. It'd be like, um, like one of those little balls that's a bunch of, like, rubber strings put together. That, oh. I, I don't know why anyone thinks those are fun. I don't know what you do with them, but. Uh, so CO2 would be like that. And, uh, and you can see that CO2, I know CO2, that would be my almost perfect definition of, an imper of a real gas, uh, better yet, an imperfect gas. Because I know CO2 forms dry ice, so I expect this is going to be one of the weirdest gases I can work with. And sure enough, these Z factors, I mean, these are crazy. 20%, uh, yeah, that, that bothers me. If, I, if I'm doing some calculations and off 20%, I don't like that. Uh, these compression factors, as correction factors, these are gigantic, 0.2. It, you're, you're giving me a number that's 80% wrong. All right, if you're an engineer, your power plant blows up if you're that far off. You're definitely going to kill people. So. Uh, now, what do I get from this? Uh, let's see. Um, here, this is kind of um, not so important. Uh, Z is temperature dependent. I, I'm not so, that's not something I generally worry too much about. But what I want to do is look at certain behaviors. Uh, Z is greater than 1. And I see that hydrogen is an oddball. Okay, now I want to think about why that would be given that I know that real gases are different from um, ideal or perfect gases because they have volume and they interact. Okay, I know that this says to me that the pressure is too high. Uh, if I look at uh, one of those, you know, if I look at that definition, the pressure definition, this says the pressure is too high for hydrogen. Right, so yeah, I can, I can actually see that right here. Uh, pressure, Ought to be uh, ought to be one, but it's really 1.2, and that's because Z is 1.2. So the pressure is too high. Now, if I had to decide what's doing that, I'm going to not pick A, the A parameter. I'm not going to pick the A parameter. I'm not going to pick molecular interaction. Molecular interaction would drive the pressure down. It drove it up. That that means that that means that the A parameter just isn't at play. That means that. This billiard ball doesn't interact with other billiard balls. Uh, oh, but, but you're saying, oh, but it does. It, it's, you know, if I want to add each other, then they do interact, right? They hit. But that's not the A parameter, that's the B parameter. 
So what I get from this is gases that have high Z factors, Z is a greater than one. Um, uh, this is due to collisions. Sorry, again, my handwriting is improving slowly. Okay, again, I've either got the A parameter or the B parameter. A obviously is not responsible for this behavior. It has to be B. B is the finite volume thing. Finite volume means you interact by hitting each other. Again, billiard balls. Billiard balls only interact by hitting each other. So hydrogen spends all of its time interacting with hydrogen by whacking into each other. Uh, so they don't like that. So th those are the haters. Those are the haters of the gas community. And so therefore, <laughs> therefore um, so let's see, uh, I'll call that B dependent. And that always have in your mind because I'm gonna I'm gonna use this a lot. A is molecular interactions, B is volume or collisions. Okay, so I got that, but now remember that hydrogen and helium, helium does this too, I just didn't draw it. Uh, okay, so for Z is less than one, what what I can see what do, what does that? Now clearly that's the A parameter. Um, uh, it's the A parameter, and I think things interact by all the reasons I said last time, so remember, uh, because of polarization, right? Induced di maybe you have a dipole, and you interact with other things with dipole, of course you do. Something like uh, um, ethene, et 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 <laughs> uh, no, methane, what the, sorry, I thought that was the issue too. Uh, yeah, I'm looking at that, sorry. Um, methane doesn't have a permanent dipole, but I bet it's very polarizable. Uh, remember I, I drew xenon, that, that would be polarization, dispersion, one forces that would be happening here. So I conclude that what drives me down is the polarization. Uh, so things can, uh, methane, cozies up to other, uh, other uh, methane, they're not haters, they're lovers, right? So they, they polarize each other, so they like that. And, uh, and so that means that the pressure is less than it should be. And I would also say that this is A dependent. And, um, and another two, another big picture uh, I want to get across here, and we can do please remember this, I'm going to write it down. That hi um, here, let me, let me also put a little note here. Hydrogen and helium behavior tends to be very different than all other gases. And while I'm sure that there are other molecules that are, you know, in human history, in chemical history, we've probably discovered most of the things that are gases naturally. Uh, maybe there's one or two more molecules that a chemist will synthesize and say, wow, that's a gas at room temperature. I kind of doubt it. But anyway, hydrogen and helium, both things that are gases, are very unusual and they're different than all the others. It's because they're hard little rocks, and it's because they're at the top of the periodic table. And uh, they only basically collide with each other. They're haters. Most other things are not like that. So um, yeah, most things are larger and more polarizable. So they actually like to be next to each other. And yeah, so there you go. I don't have much else to say about that. Now remember, I was also stating you know, that I don't care for multiplying mistakes by numbers that make them work. That's pretty pointless. I mean, I know I can do that with anything. Um, except my girlfriend, but anyway, uh, <laughs> uh, what saves the, this behavior is the fact that I can use the van der Waals equation to model it, and I know exactly what goes on inside the van der Waals equation via our algebraic manipulation from last time, what A and B are. And hopefully, you know, I don't want you to, I try rarely to throw things at you and say take my word for it, I don't like that. So, and also on the first test, I generally have a question of this nature that I'm about to show you. Okay, what I'm doing here, just write this down, I don't think do another thing. Uh, write this down, what I'm going to try to do is tease Z out of the Van der Waals equation and understand why z is bigger than one and why z is less than one. Now, I've already stated why by doing this, but now I'm going to do it with equations, which is kind of the point of this class. I'm kind of doing this in the reverse way I should have, but anyway. Okay, now I've got to get, ah, okay, I got, 
I gotta not erase things sometimes. Okay, so this is what I'm trying to get, and I got this equation to work with. And oh man, all right. Let's see how well I edit the video to get rid of that V that I wrote. So please catch it. Someone say something if I do that. Right? When I'm talking and writing, I make mistakes. So uh, again, what I'm trying to do is find Z in here. And uh, it doesn't actually look, look too bad. Um, it looks like uh, it is from here. Therefore, Z is PDM over RT. So I can do something very trivial here, uh, which is just multiply by VM. And I'll, uh, I'll always try to roll, uh, write down what I'm doing so that in your notes, when you follow your notes, and you see P is equal to blah, and you see P, D, M, C, that's actually why I screwed up before I was doing it all the time. Anyway, when you see your notes this, and you see P, D, M, you know what the heck I'm doing. And so this would be um, R, T, V, M. Not much I can do here, or not much I want to do. OK, I'm just going to go ahead and do that. OK, now um, all I have to do is divide by R, T. Uh, now I've got PVM over RT. See this? You see this? Why I, I really don't hesitate to put something like this on the test because this is really freaking easy. All right. And now I've got VM. All right, because because uh, now I've got Z. Right. This this was just shockingly easy. VM minus B minus ART over VM. Eight, no, 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 divided, divided by RT, my bad, my bad. Well, you see that's the thing, if I power pointed it, I wouldn't even have to think about it, I'd just click the button. At the same time, I'd be running my mouth, but you're struggling to actually derive it, so that's what I choose to do. I hope I'm making the right choice, I don't know. Okay, this is, you see, this is relatively easy. Now remember, and remember I said a couple of times, there's no such thing as negative or zero, um, no such thing as zero volume. I don't know about that. There's no such thing as negative volumes. There's no such thing as negative pressure. Curve fitting uh, the Van der Waals equation to data on all gases yields only positive Bs and positive As. Even for hydrogen and helium, they seem like they should have negative As, but they don't. Um, everything is positive. That, that's really important. That's going to probably come up on the next test. It's going to be on the uh, problem set. All right, with that information, is this always less than one, one, or greater than one? With that information, everything is positive. Right, this has to be greater than one because uh, now, now, if ever you get stuck with the, the kind of question I just asked, start plugging in numbers and do not use the numbers one or two because those are weird. 1 squared is 1, 2 squared is 2 times 2, or 2 plus 2. That, those are anomalous. Plug in numbers, but don't choose those. 5 over 5 minus 3, right? It has to be greater than 1, right? And remember, following the, only the principle that they have to be positive. Question? Yeah. Um, for the denominator, the minus B, was it supposed to be, could it be reduced? Uh, the, it uh, um, now, now, so you're, you're, you're thinking that... Um, um, stuff above, so, like, I know that for VM squared under A, it was reduced to VM, right. and then for that, could you reduce the VM what, denominator as well? Well, uh, no, because, all right, so the way to do that would be, so the question is, uh, so what were you thinking of, is, can I manipulate this further, uh, so that I only have one unit of VM? Yes, but it would not be good to do so. Here's how. I would multiply it to the top by 1 over Vm, and then it's gone. Then I multiply the bottom by 1 over Vm. And what I would have is 1 minus B over Vm. Okay. Yeah. So it's still there, and actually, I think you just kind of screwed yourself over. You made it actually slightly more complicated. <laughs> so uh, again, plug in numbers. This is always greater than 1. Now again, I've, I've, I'm sure class participation aside, normally I'd say, what does this do? You would say it's less than 1. So this drives it up, this drives it down, right? B, the fact that things have volume and collide, drive things up. A, things interact, <coughs> that they're polar, and they interact with their polarizable, or they have dipoles of 
which is really the same thing, I drives it down. There you go. That's just, just nice. It's just, you know, it just shows you how things really work. The Interval won a Nobel Prize for this. Don't you want a Nobel Prize? You get a billion dollars. So, kind of hard to do that. Uh, now, I also, let me draw some data to prove that. And uh, I don't know how hard it would be to make it do mixed PowerPoint board work. Maybe I would try it. Uh, so I'm going to actually again go back to CO2. The identity of the gas is not that important. You don't really need to be, don't even write this down. It's okay. Uh, it just uh, proves the point. And this is uh, more data on CO2 that I found um, on the internet. Uh, again, CO2 behavior is very, very, very strange. And so that's the that's the data. And here I'm. Um, and I'll, I'll label this. It, it, it really doesn't matter. This is the Van der Waals, and this is the real. Okay, so there you go. So this guy gives me that using A and B parameters, and again, this is CO2. And all right, so it's not. It's okay. It's, it's actually pretty good. It's not perfect. It's better than okay. It's pretty good. And remember, though, uh, anyone who would like to guess why it's not perfect. There's a little factoid about the A. Now remember, A and B parameters are why any of this works. But I can tell you, if you did this with a virial equation, it would be the dotted line and the solid, and the solid line, the compression factors, would be perfect. Van der Waals, not so much. But why? A and B factors, it has to do with the A and B factors. Any guesses? A and B uh, perfect guesses don't interfere. Uh, with it, uh, no, 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 these are all real gases. Okay, you don't remember, it's fine. A and B parameters are not temperature dependent. Right, so if you included temperature dependence to A and B parameters, I bet you'd get a much better better fit. Beta, here's my point. Vader walls are not as good as imperial. Um, but that's because A and B parameters are not uh, temperature dependent. Actually, this is not a single temperature, so maybe I don't know what I'm talking about. But anyway. Uh, but, but what you gain in the video, this is just a little factoid. I'm just testing your memory from last time. Um, yeah, it doesn't really matter, but, um, but what you gain, you know, what you lose from Van der Waals, yeah, it is less accurate, but what you gain is that it, you actually understand gas molecules, which from a chemist standpoint, not so much an engineer, but a chemist standpoint is really, really much better. Okay, so there you go. Don't forget this one. Look for the star by compression factors. And if I start by the next one, uh, I'm going to do another example of measuring non-ideal or non-perfect behavior. I tend to put these on tests. I guarantee you, you will see this again. I haven't written the test yet, uh, but, but this is, this is low-hanging fruit. Because for one, I'm telling you I'm going to put it on the test. I am going to put this on the test. And it's easy. Right? So if you have a little derivation, that's a derivative. It barely counts as a derivation. That's one of the simplest things I'll ever do. Remember, I am going to show you how to derive E equals MC squared, which is not that hard, actually, next semester. It will be more complicated than this. Okay, now there is a second way to quantify how a real gas is different from an ideal or perfect gas, which is a thing called a residual. A residual volume. And what I like about this one, the reason I tend to cover this, is if P V M dot is equal to R T. Now what I I, I, uh, I am writing the perfect gas equation because I have a little knot uh, in the um, in the equation. That means I'm using the I'm using the perfect gas equation and I'm using the perfect gas volume. And that means that this is correct, although it doesn't actually work for any real gas. Now, actually, now don't worry about this. I think that some of you who are hopefully paying a little extra attention may have realized that I had a P knot and a VM knot. I used two different ones. So you can't use them both simultaneously. What I'm doing is, if I'm going to write down the perfect gas equation, I have to know that either P or V has to be the perfect gas equation, but is not actually correct. I can't really choose both. That doesn't make sense. So just, um, I, I tend to say the perfect gas equation is correct by either using the perfect gas pressure or the perfect gas volume, but not both. Notice that I can say, as I've done here, I've said 
that this equation is right because I'm using a different volume than a real gas. I chose to do that. Or I could have said that the pressure, I could have used the perfect gas pressure, acknowledging that that actually is not correct for a real gas. I, I pick one or the other. Don't worry, it's just not a big deal. In case you just notice that I can make one or the other a little, I can put a knot on one or the other that that's right because it's kind of arbitrary which one I pick. Just don't let that cluster you if, if you've got clusters. Don't worry about it. I don't know why I'm still talking about it anyway. Okay. If this is true, and again, I'm talking about a non-existent perfect gas, uh, but it is a good starting point, then this is true. Okay, again, doesn't actually exist, exist. so let's do a real gas. Uh, it turns out that it is true that uh, PVM over RT, now notice that I did not have a little knot to find the VM, is equal to one, but only in the limits of very low pressures. Okay, that's true. Now why would that be true? And why I hazard a guess? Interaction and clickers, just like when you were freshman, you were 18 and awkward, and no one would look at you. <laughs> Why am I bringing that up? I'm awful. Anyway, <laughs> why would this be true? A and B. Uh, uh, right there, right there. Uh, yeah, at low pressure, they're not interacting. Right. Uh, that's the A parameter. Why did the B parameter not matter at low pressures? I kind of just gave it away. They're not interacting, they're not colliding. Oh, right. right, they're not colliding. Right, they're not interacting, they're not colliding, being created, the parameter just don't matter. Okay, now if this is true, my question to you is, is this true? The limit of P goes to zero, uh, and this is, again, <coughs> middle school mathematics here. If these are the same by this, then if I subtract them, would they still be zero? Sorry, still be zero. Uh, anyway, if this is true, and it is, does this make this automatically true? Uh, basically, I've taken RT, brought it over here, and subtracted both sides to get zero. Is that, is that true? It's math in case you're just like, what did I do? I, that's what I did. Is this true, though? Yeah? Yes, no? Hopefully, your instincts say yes, because it kind of looks like it should be. But you know I'm not asking this unless I meant to trick you, which is exactly what's happening. So therefore the answer is no. The answer is no, this is not true. No. Why not? Here's an example. Okay, tell you what, now, maybe you don't really want to write this down. I'll let you know when I, I think you really need to write something down. And of course I'm going to use equations. Uh, G is x plus 3. Just, I just put these uh, for the heck of it. So, and I'm not going to use the same limiting behavior because I didn't really find a good way to do that. If x goes to infinity, f over g is equal to 1, that's true. Uh, but, in the same limit, really any limit, and again, um, don't get thrown off, I'm just, the limit is different, right? But, uh, no matter what, this is still, uh, oh, now I can't subtract 5 from 3 into 2. My problem. Okay. So, if this is true, it is not necessarily true that the residual is still 0. Okay. So, uh, it's 1950s. We're trying to figure out how gases are not following the perfect uh, gas, ideal uh, gas equation. And I've compressed them to very high pressures. It was scary, but I got that information. Now I can do this one, it's a tad bit safer, and figure out what, what if I figure out this is not zero, I want to know what it actually is. And now I know how my gases are not perfect, and maybe I don't quite know why that's useful, but that's what we're here for, so you're going to take it. Um, so uh, what I want to do is, um, let's see, I'm going to define Residual volume, so it's just inside. I don't care if you're down or not. So, residual volume, uh, the formal definition I will use, and possibly on a test, I have to look at what I asked last time. And then, of course, I pick the other, whether I did residual volume or compression factor. Maybe I'll do both. Maybe I have one on test one, the other on the final. Uh, so, 
I like to work with volumes because it's a little bit easier. So this is the definition of the residual volume of a real gas. And let me make this a little bit easier to see what I'm doing again. Sorry, that piece a little small. My OCD kicking in. That is worse as my age, but anyway. Okay, so um, yeah. Now, again, a metric for uh, real gas behavior. I've got my uh, Van der Waals equation up there. What I'm going to do is manipulate the Van der Waals equation into this form, and then I will see what makes residual volumes not zero, essentially. And again, you can see how uh, this uh, is so boring. This, one, this one's actually kind of long, by the way. So this is why I do this one second. Sounds like my cat warming up when I move this thing. Uh, yeah, this one's a little complicated uh, because uh, what you're going to see me do here and a couple others is sometimes I have to stop a derivation and do a second smaller one and insert that result in. And that's a bit painful, but I don't really know of any other good way to do that. Okay, so let me let me uh, write that down again as I formally do this problem. Uh, the, um, and just recall that what I'm trying to do is manipulate the Van der Waals equation into that form. And of course, the Van der Waals equation is this. And hopefully you can um, write that down without thinking about it. Uh, of course, that, that is not what's on the test. I do not ask such trivial questions. What is the Van der Waals equation? It is in the cheat sheet, which I will send to you the Wednesday before the exam. OK, this has to turn into that algebra. That's how I got to do it. And let's see, I know that I quite remember. OK, all right, got to get Vm on the side. And I'm not, since I'm not taking a derivative, as long as I can get Vm on this side, I'm not going to worry if it's still on the right hand side. That's okay. It's not okay when I'm doing derivatives, but I'm not doing a derivative. I got to get rid of p, so I'm going to uh, here. And again, I'm going to tell you what I'm going to what I'm going to do, so that you don't get lost in your own notes. So I'm multiplying by Vm minus b. And I'm going to divide by p. Why? Because that immediately puts Vm minus b over here, and now I've got r p over p. And then I got a bunch of stuff left over, but I'm not going to worry about that so much um, because I'm not really doing any kind of calculus during derivation. I'm doing the, um, um, I'm just doing the algebraic one and um, uh, divided by p. Yeah, yeah, there you go. Okay, notice that I've actually completely set myself up pretty well. I've got my Vm over here. I've got my RT over P right here. I don't have any other knots or squiggles or anything. So uh, all I have to do is permute. All I do is permute these factors. And especially what I like is that um, uh, that minus B becomes positive if I bring it over here. And then this, this thing is in a bit of an unholy mess. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, break this up into two terms, and I'm actually doing that in my head, hopefully I'm not screwing it up. Okay. Now I've noticed that I've pretty much got residual volume, except that I do have to apply the limit, and I know, you know, I remember when I took math, it was kind of nutty how they were so stringent on following rules, and it is absolutely important I write the word m to zero. That actually is the case for a really weird reason. Uh, and this derivation. Okay, so now I've got the residual volume. And so I don't have to think about the left hand. That part I'm done. What I've got to do is deal with this. A over D uh, uh, PVM. And sorry, I'm kind of operating on memory and I'm not screwing up. Okay, now problem is that pressure is going to zero. OK, so uh, this is nice. Residual volume, I'm seeing the B parameter. Yeah, OK, just hold on. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. What I don't like is uh, this 1 over P term here and here, because P is going to zero. 
1 over something going to 0 goes to infinity. So this is blowing up. It, this should have been small. It should have been 0. It's not 0 because of real gas behavior. But instead, my, my uh, Van der Waals equation, which is accurate, is actually saying, well, actually, if you depressurize a gas, it will explode at the speed of light and wipe out the universe. No. So, uh, well, well, okay, if pressure is going to zero, it needs to be balanced out. What's it balanced out by? How did I make it go to zero? How do, how do I make this go to zero? VM goes up, right, right. So do you think they balance? Well, they got to, right? Here's formally how. Here's a... Um, now, now remember that I told you, uh, sorry, uh, what I, I, remember I said that sometimes I had to do one derivation, uh, I had to stop something and uh, um, formally do another derivation. Uh, I just wrote this a second ago, but it is very repeating. Okay, if I, if I have this, again, this is real gas behavior, what I can do is, um, because it is very difficult to know how PVM are going to balance each other out, I really don't know because one's going to zero, one's going to infinity. How that, how they fight each other out to win is not clear to me. So instead, I use this, and so I substitute a PVM with RT. Uh, and this is okay, by the way. I know it seems a little funky because I just was bragging about um, how residual volume seems to like implies that doesn't work, but it actually does. Okay. So now, I've done myself a lot of good, but I contend that this can be simplified further. How so? Okay, this guy we're not going to mess with, obviously I'm leaving this there. This guy, A is A, R, T is, uh, now if, if I depressurize something, I bet it cools. Gases generally tend to cool when they expand. Uh, but I can warm it back up. So this guy's behaved. Now what about this? Goes to zero. Right, right, right. Remember, VM. VM is still exploding. Right, so this guy, this guy's gone. So it's V minus A over RT. Okay, this is kind of nice. So residual volume is mostly the volume of the gas itself. The thing that actually does not exist is I'm talking about a perfect gas. But balancing that is that thing that tends to make itself shrink, which is attractive forces which takes that volume, it takes all those molecules that have volume, and it makes them like come together, uh, which would kind of like artificially shrink them as though they weren't there. So, there you go. And I don't have much else to say about that other than memorize this. It's on the test. <laughs> it may be on the test. I'll tell you more before the test. Okay, last bit, and then we are done with this. I'm sorry again, I ran my mouth. Fortunately, I didn't talk too much about Game of Thrones. Uh, so, I've done a little bit better than normal. I want to just show you one other really cool thing about the Van der Waals equation. I do have about one minute, which will be all the time I need. I, I, I know I'm bad about holding you. You've already figured that out. I'm going to for that. Actually, I want to show you a little cool thing about, uh, I want to show you some isotherms, and what I'm going to do is cool the gas. As I said a couple of times that um, if you're at, uh, as we talk about isotherm, P versus D, sorry, 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 I'm rushing. You know I'm rushing, I start making mistakes. P versus D, this is a high temperature isotherm, and at high temperature gases do actually tend to behave more like uh, perfect or ideal gases. But what happens is when I cool them, uh, they actually get kinks, right? I don't see that perfect um, one over X type behavior. And as I cool them further, I'm gonna see something very strange. I'm gonna see actually a complete, uh, this is, very uh, unrealistic, by the way. It's just to get a point home. I see uh, P versus D level off. And if I, again, this is with the Van der Waals equation, if I drive it further, I see this behavior. And again, I, I, I'm being very extreme in my, uh, I'm exaggerating this like unbelievable when you get the point. Now, this says, the Van der Waals equation says, under certain PVs and Ts, remember these are certain Ts, these are isotherms, that if I, let's actually go this way, it's a bit easier. If I decrease volume, pressure goes down. Again, I'm squeezing my, my um, I have some like accordion and I'm squeezing it and the pressure's going down as I do so. When does that happen? 
Remember, it's a real gas. When, when does a real gas do that? When do you compress? Remember, a real gas. When do you compress real gas and the pressure drop as a result? When would that happen? Begins with the letter N. And it sounds like ever. Never. 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 <laughs> it never happens. Okay, this is bizarre. Again, the may, all right, here, here, you're decreasing the volume and the pressure is not moving. And here, the pressure uh, does move and it goes the wrong way. Okay, now, uh, you can actually chart this behavior. There's certain, like, um, reflect um, inflection, certain double derivatives that are actually kind of odd. So I can kind of plot this region in the P versus V isotherms where the gas behavior is, like, really screwed up. Okay, now here's my question to you. Okay, certain pressure, let's just pick a point. <coughs> certain pressure, certain volume, certain temperature. I, I, I got a box. Got a box full of gas. Whatever gas. It was up here, it's a gas. Now, I depressurize, devolume, and cool, so it's right here. I look at the box, what do I see? A gas? Yes, a liquid. Right, a liquid. This behavior is impossible. It cannot happen. So what happens is, for nature to, to violate the Van der Waals equation, it does the only thing left open to it. It gets rid of the gas itself. The only way to do that is for the gas to become a liquid. The Van der Waals equation predicts liquid-like behavior, which is kind of awesome, by the way. So.